Well, thank you very much for inviting me to introduce Sanjay, and thank you for inviting uh, Sanjay Patel to give uh, to give this talk. As I was just mentioning uh, to Jim and Ashish, this this is a very prestigious grand round. I've been following them very uh, assiduously, and uh, I think they're of the highest quality. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Sanjay Patel, uh, who uh, is uh, assistant professor of pathology uh, in, in our department. Sanjay uh, got his uh, Bachelor of Science at the University of Rochester, proceeded to get um, a Master of Science and a Master of Public Health from Tufts University, uh, and then his MD at St. George's University, and then a residency at the University of Wisconsin in both anatomic and clinical pathology. Uh, I uh, got to know Sanjay, Sanjay at the Brigham, uh, where uh, at that time he was a, a Jerry Pinker's fellow in translational research in hematopathology and uh, worked in uh, the lab that I, uh, in part in the lab that I was directing in, uh, in uh, multi-parametric uh, imaging. His interest has been uh, in, uh, of course, hematopathology, more specifically in AML, and even more specifically is the subject of his talk today on NPM1 uh, mutated AML, uh, where uh, uh, his efforts have been to uh, link the quantitation of uh, NPM1 uh, mutant uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, prognosis. He has published significant papers as first authors in blood, uh, American Journal of Hematolo Hematology, uh, and uh, has uh, written reviews uh, with uh, Scott Rodig and, and, and Mike Kluke and others uh, on um, both imaging and NPM uh, biology. Uh, we consider ourselves very fortunate to have him uh, join the department just about the time when I joined. Uh, and um, without further ado, I don't want to take any more time, but. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, uh, Dr. Patel's talk uh, today. Sanjay? Uh, thanks, Max, for the kind introduction. Thanks, uh, Jim and Ashish, for welcoming me to uh, present here today. Uh, the topic of my presentation is NPM1 mutated myeloid neoplasms, clinical pathologic features, and emerging therapies. Uh, this is an area that I became interested in as a clinical fellow, um, kind of serendipitously. Uh, and it's become something I've become very excited about over the last couple of years. So I'll get further into the talk. I think you have to share your screen. Is it, is it working? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can see. So I've broken this talk down into two parts. Uh, in the first, uh, I'm going to talk about the clinical pathologic features of NPM1 NPM mutated myeloid neoplasms. <laughs> uh, highlighting uh, some studies in AML and non-acute settings. Um, in a one hour is not insufficient time to discuss everything related to NPM1 myeloid neoplasm, so I'll, I'll highlight some of my own work in this area. And in the second half, I'd like to talk about some uh, new, you know, cutting edge studies in the last couple of years that are being rapidly translated to the clinic and have promise for, um, for treating this disease. So NPM1 uh, is, uh, stands for nucleophosmin. This is a ubiquitously expressed protein in tissues. It's one of the most abundant nucleolar and nuclear phosphoproteins, which shuttles between the nucleolus, nucleus, and the cytoplasm as part of its normal function. Uh, in this role, it acts as a molecular chaperone for a variety of proteins and nucleic acids, and I've listed several uh, different uh, cellular components that it, um, it uh, works with. So there are some key functions of the wild-type NPM1 protein, including um, inhibition of centrosome duplication. So uh, NPM1 has to, has to remove itself from this location in order for centrosome duplication to occur. Uh, it cooperates in ribosome biogenesis by transporting ribosomal particles out of the nucleolus. Uh, it acts as a histone chaperone and also participates in DNA repair, for example, by uh, uh, protecting TB53. So uh, based on these myriad functions, uh, NPM1 aberrations have the, potentially to have the potential to contribute to oncogenesis in a variety of mechanisms and pathways, depending on how NPM1 is affected. 
So in the normal state, for example, um, nucleolar stress causes uh, NPM1 to sequester uh, MDM2 or HDM2, which is a E3 ubiquitin ligase targeting TPV3. Uh, and this mechanism allows TPV3 to be active um, and to protect the cell in this state of stress. So NPM1 uh, is located on uh, chromosome five, the long arm of chromosome five. It's a 12 exon gene, uh, which has a few different um, or several different importing, important coding regions. I'll highlight a few of them here. So one of them is a nuclear export signal at its uh, end terminus. Um, it has two nuclear localization signals at the center of the coding sequence. And then importantly, a nucleolar localization signal. So the combination of these uh, different regions of the protein uh, drive uh, the wild type protein to be predominantly found in the nucleus, in the nucleus and nucleolus. Uh, and this nucleolar localization signal is quite important for that. And this is, there are two tryptophan residues at this C-terminal location that are important for that uh, lo uh, localization. So uh, some of you may be familiar with common translocations involving NPM1, notably NPM1 ALK in anaplastic large cell lymphoma, NPM1 RARA in uh, rare subtypes of promyelocytic leukemia. Uh, and notably, all of these translocations remove the C-terminal portion of the protein uh, in, in the process of fusing it to a partner. Uh, in this uh, loss of the C-terminal protein, importantly, is lost the nucleolar localization signal. And so many of these fusion protein products are predominantly cytoplasmically located. So in the context of uh, acute myeloid leukemia, NPM1 mutations were first discovered uh, by Bernangelo Fellini. Uh, Fellini is the godfather of all things uh, related to NPM1 and also many other, uh, as basically behind many other seminal discoveries in the area of hematolymphoid neoplasia. But in 2005, uh, Fellini uh, and his group basically tried to look for uh, novel translocations in acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, and this is published in the New England Journal. And basically what they did was stain nearly 2,000 different bone marrow core biopsy samples with an N-terminal directed antibody to nucleophosphate. So this would be agnostic to uh, any mutations or translocations affecting the C-terminal portion of the protein. And they simply wanted to look for aberrant cytoplasmic dislocalization of the protein. So here you can see that there is aberrant cytoplasmic dislocalization with cytoplasmic staining in numerous cases of de novo AML. Uh, this is predominantly found in FAB subtypes of M4, M5. These are monocytic types of AMLs. And so they thought, you know, potentially this would be a result of translocation. But in fact, all of the cases that were uh, analyzed by PCR, by uh, sequencing of the NPM1 gene, identified C-terminal uh, uh, mutations involving the gene rather than translocations. Uh, far and away, these were in normal karyotype AMLs, although there were a few abnormal karyotype um, uh, samples present. Uh, and these mutations were not found in any other of the disease studied, including CML and lymphoid neoplasms. So, uh, going, you know, continuing further on to this work, what they identified were that most of these mutations are four base pair insertion mutations involving uh, exon 12. Uh, and what these insertion mutations do are delete the critical nucleolar localization signal sequence and introduce a new nuclear export signal, uh, which depending on where the insertion occurs, uh, can be quite powerful. So there's varying degrees of strength of this new nuclear export signal that's introduced. Uh, but the net outcome of this is that the uh, mutant protein is predominantly cytoplasmically located. And importantly, uh, both wild type and mutant proteins have a uh, heterodimerization and oligodimerization domain at their end terminus. So this, in fact, uh, results in a haploinsufficient state where mutant protein can bind up residual wild type protein sequestering it into the cytoplasm. And so these are always heterozygous mutations, but they're haploinsufficient. So to illustrate that, uh, here is a schematic of homozygous, the homozygous state for NPM1 wild type protein. So as I mentioned, uh, this protein is predominantly, wild type protein is predominantly in the nucleus and nucleolus. 
In the nucleolus, it's often found in a pentameric form, whereas in the nucleus, it's found in a monomeric form. And a normal wild-type protein shuttles between the nucleus and nucleolus and the cytoplasm as part of its normal function. In the setting of a mutant protein or heterozygous somatic mutations involving the C-terminus, uh, you know, again, wild-type protein can traffic between the nucleus and cytoplasm, but mutant protein will bind up wild-type protein and sequester it in the cytoplasm aberrantly. So in the last few years, there have been some seminal discoveries about partner proteins for NPM1, um, and mutant NPM1 is able to sequester many of these proteins into the cytoplasm, removing them from their normal and critical localizations within the cell. So some of these include CTCF, which is a chromatin-related protein, PU.1, which is a monocytic transcription factor, and FBXW7, which is a negative rate regulator of CMYK. So for example, you might imagine that if uh, the negative reg regulator of CMYK is aberrantly cytoplasmically sequestered, uh, there is abnormal uh, expression and maintenance of CMYK activity within the cell, which could contribute to oncogenesis. So, uh, you know, far and away the most common uh, exon 12 mutations involving MPM1 occur, uh, are, are four base pair duplication mutations that duplicate a TCTG sequence. Uh, these were discovered first. They comprise about 80% of mutations that I've identified and have thus been deemed type A. Uh, there are a couple other mutations, type B and D, which are seen in fewer cases, and then a whole host of other variants, which are seen much more rarely, overall less than 1% of cases. So the hypothetical ontogeny of NPM1 mutated AML has kind of evolved over time, uh, but begins with normal CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, what we've come to find is that, um, you know, the setting in which NPM1 is most oncogenic is in the background of a founder mutation uh, like DNMT3A. These are often participants in uh, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, which you may have uh, heard of. Um, and so DNMT3 mutations might set the stage. Now, the lymphoid lineage commitment occurs, um, but never involves an NPM1 mutation. So NPM1 mutations are never found in the lymphoid compartment. They're really only found in myeloid committed cells. So, uh, you know, for example, you might have a cell that has undergone a DNMT3 mutation and then acquired a second NPM1 mutation. Um, these, this population of cells can expand uh, and then can give rise to a CD34 negative leukemic bulk population that has both NPM1 and DNMT3A mutations. But probably more commonly, additional mutational events occur, uh, rarely chromosomal events, because most NPM1 mutated diseases are normal karyotype diseases. Uh, but additional events uh, most often occur, uh, giving rise to you know, a, a greater likelihood of leukemic proliferation. So as I mentioned, most NPM1 mutated acute myeloid leukemias have a normal karyotype, although occasionally abnormal karyotypic uh, sub, uh, samples are uh, found. <clears throat> so uh, one of the seminal papers uh, looking at the frequency of NPM1 mutations in AML was performed by Papamuniol et al, uh, and released in 2013. Uh, and in this study, they looked at over 100 different genes uh, by targeted sequencing uh, in about 1,500 AML patients that were part of clinical trials. And what they found, and this uh, finding has been confirmed by uh, many other groups in many different studies, is that uh, somatic NPM1 mutations occur in about 30% of de novo AMLs and are typically associated with an intermediate or favorable risk profile. Uh, the, the profile and survival of NPM1 mutated AMLs is typically uh, uh, similar to that of core binding factor leukemias like uh, T821, RUNX1, RUNX1, T1. Uh, so generally, it's just considered to confer a favorable risk in the setting of de novo AML. Uh, now, NPM1 alone uh, might confer a favorable risk, but frequently NPM1 is joined by other mutations, uh, notably in the genes uh, FMS like tyrosine kinase 3 or FLIP3, these are, can be internal tandem duplications or tyrosine kinase domain mutations, uh, and then also in DNMT3A. So uh, the combination of these three mutations together has been found to be explicitly um, 
uh, aggressive uh, as a group. And so uh, the current ELN guidelines uh, and for their favorable intermediate and adverse risk categories all include some component of NPM1 mutated disease or wild type disease. Uh, and FLT3 ITD mutations are also an important player in this and are typically stratified by whether their allele fraction is above or below 50%. So one of the important facets that has emerged uh, in the setting of NPM1 mutated disease has been the, the, con uh, the concept of minimal residual disease identification. Uh, and NPM1 mutations are a very powerful tool in this setting because the mutations uh, are present at low levels in patients who subsequently relapse. So this is a, subs this is a seminal paper uh, by Ivy et al. published in 2016. Uh, where they looked at nearly 3,000 different samples uh, from over th about 350 different patients as part of a few different clinical trials. Uh, they performed targeted gene sequencing and then used a, uh, a highly sensitive RTQ-PCR assay to uh, detect mutant NPM1 transcripts. And what they found was that MRD positive status was a very powerful indicator for imminent relapse uh, and poor overall survival. So uh, one of the things we've tried to do here uh, at my you know, former institution and again at Cornell is look for other simple tools by which to help us screen for mineral residual, residual disease and NPM1 mutated AML. And so one of these tools is a mutant, uh, is an antibody against the mutant type A protein. This antibody recognizes many of the other variants, including B and D, by virtue of their sequence homology. Uh, but here is an example of a patient who uh, underwent induction chemotherapy uh, and post-therapy we performed a bone marrow biopsy evaluation where we didn't see any obvious evidence of residual disease. There was no increase in blasts either by aspirate differential morphology or by review of the core biopsy. But when we performed uh, anti-mutant NPM1 specific immunohistochemistry, we saw clusters of positive cells. Uh, this finding was corroborated by our own in-house uh, molecular assay, which is the same RT-PCR MRD assay. So we routinely use this antibody in both the diagnostic and post-therapy settings just to help us and guide us uh, in detection of residual disease. Uh, it's a surrogate marker, but not a replacement for the molecular assay. So one of the things that I've tried to do uh, recently is utilize this powerful uh, mutant protein-specific antibody in the setting of multiparametric in-situ imaging. Uh, so multiparametric in-situ imaging is, the, is a tool by which we can look for multiple different biomarkers, protein biomarkers or nucleic acid biomarkers in a single tissue section. Uh, and very limited work had been done in this previously in decalcified bone marrow samples because they're uh, technically difficult to work with. Uh, but we optimize a technique by which to do this. And here is a study that we published in Modern Pathology uh, where we analyzed 17 different cases uh, using bone marrow core biopsies from diagnostic samples of NPM1 mutated AML patients. And so we looked at a few different markers concurrently within a single section, including T cell markers, CD3, CD4, and CD8, uh, the stem cell marker, CD34, and then again, uh, mutant NPM1 protein. And so you can see the different patterns here. This is a representative case, uh, case six. So one of the you know, types of questions we can answer with this tool are to look for rare populations that are hard to see in aspirated samples. And so one of the, um, you know, the mechanisms that has been proposed is that uh, while NPM1 mutated AMLs are typically CD34 negative, as I showed in the ontogeny or the hypothetical ontogeny, uh, the mutations have to arise somewhere. So this paper uh, from 2010 proposed that, in fact, there is a CD34 popul positive population of cells that harbors the NPM1 mutation, and that's really what gives rise to the bulk leukemic population. But we have a hard time seeing this in uh, by flow cytometry and diagnostic samples, and so I thought maybe potential to look for this in the bone marrow tissue itself. And so here, across the 17 cases we analyzed, we did indeed find uh, this rare dual positive population, CD34 positive NPM1 mutated, although this is quite rare uh, across these 17 samples. You can see these are dual positive cells here. So where are we now? So now uh, AML has been, uh, with a mutated NPM1, has been formally recognized as a, as a distinct entity in our revised 2016 WHO classification. 
to summarize, this is a mutation seen in about 30% of AML cases, including uh, enrichment in normal karyotype AMLs. Uh, the prognosis is generally favorable unless coupled with a couple um, adverse uh, genetic mutations, including FLT3ITD and DNMT3A. Uh, and MRD uh, is basically a bona fide marker of poor prognosis, although uh, up until recently, little had been known about the uh, mutant allele fraction at diagnosis as it might relate to uh, inferior outcome. So this is something we tried to look at a couple of years ago. So in this study, we uh, retrospectively queried the data, uh, databases at two institutions, Mass General and Dana-Farber uh, in the Brigham Women's. Uh, we identified 109 total cases of de novo AML with mutated NPM1. Uh, these were defined by WHO criteria, as I've shown. Uh, all of these patients had undergone uh, induction chemotherapy uh, uh, with or without subsequent stem cell transplantation. And we had next generation sequencing data available for all, all patients. So uh, this is a retrospective study. So the NGS uh, uh, analyses are performed predominantly on bone marrow, but also on some peripheral blood samples. Uh, there were a few different testing platforms that had been utilized across the two institutions. Uh, we used standard variant calling criteria and then classified the various mutations we found according to uh, established uh, pathways and uh, using established uh, databases. So to analyze the outcome data, we uh, looked at overall survival and event-free survival. We looked at a variety of continuous and categorical variables to stratify the data, uh, including things like age and white cell count, blast percentages. And then importantly, we looked at the variant allele fraction specifically for NPM, mutant NPM1 uh, as both a binary and continuous variable or categorical and continuous variable. And then also looked at the VAF of several other genes uh, that were highly enriched in this uh, cohort. Uh, we performed both univariate and multivariable analyses uh, for overall survival and event-free survival related uh, uh, parameters. So uh, this is a broad look at the mutational spectrum within this uh, cohort of 109 de novo NPM1 mutated AML patients. Uh, much of this data confirms what has been seen, what was seen previously in the literature, being that uh, about 50% of our cases had DNMT3A mutations, and overall, uh, most of the co-occurring mutations occurred in DNA path, uh, methylation pathway. Um, DNMT3A notably was the only mutation significantly associated with shorter overall survival, corroborating uh, the findings by Papamunial and others. And so in this uh, heat map on the right, I'm basically showing our cohort stratified into the uppermost quartile for mutated NPM1 VAF and the lower three quartiles. So increasing variant allele fraction moving from right to left. So our most crit uh, important finding in this study was that high mutant NPM1 uh, variant allele fraction predicted unfavorable outcomes. So uh, the significantly inferior overall survival and event-free survival uh, and in subgroup analyses of patients who were censored at the time they received stem cell transplant, or in those who received stem cell transplant, uh, this negative prognostic impact of high NPM1 mutant uh, variant allele fraction still held. So importantly also, uh, this uh, negative effect was seen in patients, even if they, whether they had DNMT 3A co-occurring mu co mutations or did not, and then in multivariable analyses, um, high NPM1 mutant variant allele fraction uh, was an independent prognostic factor for both overall survival and event-free survival. So this was really the first study to highlight this potential negative consequence of high NPM1 mutant VAF. And there have been a series of other studies, both published and in abstract form since that time that have tried to address uh, this same finding in separate cohorts. Uh, with varying consistency. So some have confirmed our finding and some have uh, in fact refuted it. And so I think what this means is essentially that prospective studies that are controlled uh, in, the, in the context of clinical trials are warranted. Um, and so we'll see how this shakes out moving forward. So I'd like to touch briefly on uh, the setting, the context of non-acute NPM1 mutated myeloid neoplasms. 
So non-acute NPM1 mediated myeloid neoplasms, uh, these are somatic mutations occurring rarely in secondary AMLs or non-AML myeloid neoplasms. So these are pre-leukemic states. So previous studies have basically shown that about one to 5% of myelodysplastic syndromes or myelodysplastic myeloproliferative overlap neoplasms harbored these same NPM1 mutations commonly seen in AML. Uh, these several small series had found these mutations uh, to be associated with aggressive disease and rapid progression to overt leukemia. Uh, but a large comprehensive clinical pathologic and genetic characterization of these types of cases had not yet been performed. And so that's what we decided to undertake. So uh, we collaborated with several different academic medical institutions to identify cases of this type. And so these were uh, 45 cases in total, the largest uh, cohort assembled to date. Uh, that fulfilled inclusion criteria. So these were MDS or MDS-MPN cases. All of these cases, importantly, are, had fewer than 20% blood or bone marrow blasts at diagnosis, and all of them harbored uh, canonical C-terminal insertion mutations involving NPM1. So we needed to compare this cohort to two control cohorts, so we assembled two different cohorts uh, to meet that need, one of which was deemed NPM1 negative, uh, myeloid neoplasms. Uh, so these were uh, MDS and MDS-MPN cases that we matched by disease subtype to our NPM1 mutated cohort. And then we also included uh, the pub, uh, cohort I described just previously of NPM1 mutated AMLs. So uh, next generation sequencing studies have been performed at all of the institutions that were participants in this uh, study. And so we identified uh, several genes that were overlapping between all of the different panels that were uh, present at the participating institutions. Uh, a subset of the cases also queried SRSF2 mutations. So many of these mutations are, are key players in myeloid neoplasia, again, again, including DNMT3A, IDH1 and 2, KRAS and NRAS, AXXL1, and others. So again, we uh, performed some important statistical analyses, trying to evaluate overall survival across these three cohorts, uh, and then also looking at continuous and categorical variables, again, including age, white cell count, uh, blast percentages, IPSSR scores for the MDS cases, uh, and then rates of abnormal karyotype and specific mutations that I just identified. So, um, you know, we extracted a subset of these patients, only the ones who had MDS across the two cohorts. Uh, these were 86 total patients, 26 of them being NPM1 mutated and 60 being NPM1 wild type. Uh, and then I, in this subset, tried to identify by backward elimination in multivariable models factors that were significantly predictive of adverse outcome. And so we included things like IPSSR score, total mutations at diagnosis, and other categorical variables as I've shown. So here are the characteristics of our three cohorts. We, again, we had 95 NPM1 wild type myeloid neoplasms, 45 NPM1 mutated, non-acute myeloid neoplasms, and 119 NPM1 mutated AMLs. So I'll just highlight a couple of salient features here. Uh, the first of which is that NPM1 mutated disease typically occurred in younger individuals uh, with a male to female ratio of about one to one. Uh, and interestingly, um, and importantly, all of these NPM1 mutated myeloid neoplasm patients, or the vast majority of them, received hypomethylene agent, ther uh, hypomethylene agent therapy, which is the typical therapy for MDS patients. Um, now, uh, we would have hypothesized that, as been should previously, most of these NPM1 mutated myeloid neoplasms would have demonstrated a very rapid progression to AML. And in fact, um, the median time to progression was shorter than it was for wild type cases, but not significantly so in this cohort. So here are the, uh, is the genetic overview of these three cohorts. And so I've highlighted the key differences between them. Uh, and these differences serve to highlight or basically uh, uh, conclude that NPM1 mutated myeloid neoplasms are biologically more similar to NPM1 mutated AML than they are to NPM1 wild type myeloid neoplasms in spite of being matched for disease subtype. And so NPM1 wild type myeloid neoplasms, uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, mutated myeloid neoplasms more frequently harbored mutations in DNMT3A and PTPN11 like their AML counterpart, 
and less frequently harbored mutations in ASXL1, RUNX1, and T53, and far and away less frequently had an abnormal karyotype. Uh, in comparison to NPM1 mutated AMLs, um, uh, NPM1 mutated myeloid neoplasms, the non-acute forms, uh, less frequently had IDH1 and 2 mutations, and less frequently had KRAS or NRAS mutations, uh, and overall uh, lower mutational counts. Uh, and so importantly, uh, when we looked at overall survival, these patients who had non-acute NPM1 mutated myeloid neoplasms uh, had a shorter overall survival, roughly 15 months, 15 to 16 months shorter than their wild type counterparts. And so all of the, both of these groups predominantly received HMA therapy. Um, and so in multivariable models, we again identified that NPM1 mutation was an independent prognostic factor for inferior overall survival amongst all patients classified as having MDS, raising the possibility that the, uh, there's a limited effect of HMA therapy in NPM1 mutated disease. And another group concurrently identified similar findings uh, in a paper published around the same time. Uh, so I'd just like to thank some of my collaborators for uh, this portion of the work and the work that I performed while uh, at the Brigham. Uh, in the second half of the talk, I'd like to discuss some you know, new cutting-edge discoveries that are being rapidly translated into the clinic and hold a lot of promise for uh, therapy and NPM1 mutated disease. Uh, the first of which is BCL2 inhibition. So BCL2, uh, BCLXL, MCL1, these are all proteins that are part of the BCL2 family, which you may be familiar with. Now, these are anti-apoptotic proteins, which work by sequestering pro-apoptotic proteins like BAX and BAC. And BAX and BAC are responsible for increasing mitochondrial membrane permeability, uh, resulting in the efflux of cytochrome C and apoptosis. And so in physiologic states, when apoptosis is necessary, uh, pro-apoptotic factors, a part of the BH called the BH3 only family like BIM, uh, bind to BH3 domains in proteins like B BCL2, uh, inhibiting them from sequestering proteins like BAX. So venetoclax is part of a family of small molecules that are essentially called BH3 mimetics because they mimic the activity of proteins like BIM. Uh, they bind to these BH3 domains and artificially free up uh, BACs and BAC to perform their pro apoptotic functions. So, uh, you know, while uh, the, so the first evidence that uh, these types of molecules might have efficacy in NPM1 mutated AML specifically has really been produced quite recently in 2020. And so this paper by Visayan and Leukemia basically showed that uh, NPM1 mutated AML cases in this, uh, these are primary AML samples. So in this case, eight of them uh, had exquisite sensitivity to venetoclax or ABT199. Uh, you know, also uh, these patients had significant sensitivity to FLT3 IT inhibitors, which exceeded the sensitivity to conventional chemotherapeutic drugs like donorobicin and cytarabine. And so in both discovery and validation sets, the ICD50 uh, for, um, for venetoclax and NPM1 mutated disease was about two-fold lower uh, than it was in wild-type samples. So unsurprisingly then, uh, you know, this initial work by Courtney DiNardo, uh, also published in 2020, uh, looked at 81 total patients who were treatment naive. These were, uh, many of them were older patients uh, with de novo AML, uh, comparing the efficacy of venetoclax plus uh, low-dose era C or cytarabine uh, or hypomethylene agent therapy. And what they found is that uh, far and away in the group of patients, in these 18 patients who exhibited durable remission, uh, most of these were enriched for NPM1 uh, mutations. And so out of 16 NPM1 mutated AML patients, about 93% of them demonstrated a complete response or a complete response with incomplete recovery. So a very exquisite response to uh, venetoclax. Uh, in a follow-up study, also led by uh, Courtney DiNardo, they looked specifically at NPM1 mutated AML patients. In this case, uh, 28 of in, in this case, um, uh, nearly 300 of them. And so they had 28 patients in uh, in one arm who received both hypomethylene agent and venetoclax therapy. 47 who received HMA therapy alone. Uh, and then 228 who received conventional induction chemotherapy. 
Uh, and these findings corroborate uh, what I proposed in a few slides back in our retrospective study is that, that hypomethylating agent therapy and npm one mutated disease doesn't appear to be particularly efficacious. Conversely, the addition of venetoclax shows uh, exquisite efficacy, and notably, uh, this efficacy is pronounced in older patients. So while patients of all ages uh, do not demonstrate a significant separation of curves here in, comparison, in comparing induction chemotherapy with venetoclax combined therapy, uh, in patients who are older, uh, there's a clear uh, outcome difference. So uh, most recently, uh, this work has been expanded and published in the New England Journal. Uh, and again, uh, including many different subtypes of AML, many different mutational profiles, but again, uh, NPM1 mutated uh, patients uh, had exquisitely uh, favorable outcomes when uh, azacitidine and HMA like azacitidine and venetoclax were combined. So moving on to a couple other pathways that are being targeted in this disease. So um, the first of which uh, is XPO, and this is the nuclear pore complex exportin or CRM1. So uh, first I have to touch briefly on the, uh, uh, on the importance of Hox uh, genes in normal hematopoiesis. So you might be familiar with Hox genes in the context of uh, normal human development and skeletal uh, patterning. Uh, but Hox genes, at least specific, specific uh, clusters of them are important in normal hematopoiesis, notably Hox A9. So HOXA9 is a gene which is highly upregulated in hematopoietic stem cells, uh, and then the, the, the expression of which is uh, dramatically decreases uh, as, uh, the, as these cells uh, mature and progress through myeloid commitment. Uh, HOXA9 regulation uh, is, uh, there are a few different complexes that participate in its regulation, notably the MLL complex and the PRC2 complex. PRC2 includes proteins like SUS12 and EZH2. So while MLL complex uh, promotes HOXA9 expression, uh, this promotion is antagonized by PRC2. So the MLL complex includes uh, uh, several different important proteins, notably MLL, mixed lineage leukemia protein, and menin. Um, and these cooperate uh, to introduce uh, trimethylation at lysine 4 of histone 3, which is an activation mark at the promoter for HOXA9. So some of the first evidence that uh, HOXA9 and its, one of its cofactor, MES1, are overexpressed in primary, primary AML samples came uh, through RNA's protection assays uh, reported in 1999 by Lawrence et al. Uh, and these showed that uh, numerous primary AML samples demonstrated uh, increased expression of both HOXA9 and MES1. And interestingly, there was enrichment in M4 and M1 type AMLs, but no uh, real overexpression in M3 AMLs, which are promyelocytic leukemias. So fast forward several years, uh, and again, Fellini's group led by Alkale in this case, uh, looked at uh, using affymetrics and uh, RT-PCR, RTQ-PCR based assays, the expression of transcripts in NPM1 mutated AML. So they started with, uh, you know, a few thousand different transcripts and ultimately identified uh, some very enriched genes um, uh, in NPM1 mutated AML samples. And here they've compared uh, by two different assays, affymetrics, chips, and RTQ-PCR, these highly enriched genes. And so you note that they are in, this gene set is enriched for genes like HOXA9 and MES1, which are highly upregulated in NPM1 mutated samples relative to NPM1 wild type samples. So what this basically suggests is that there is a maintenance of the stem cell program in NPM1 mutated AML cells. So how might this work? So there's a model, proposed model for HOXA9 mediated leukemogenesis. Uh, and really this has been found to be active in two uh, main subtypes of AML, one being MLL rearranged AML and the other being NPM1 mutated AML. And so as I've shown here, there are a few different types of AML states, uh, including NPM1 mutated AML, also AMLs harboring NUP98 fusions. And all of these, uh, in some way, drive HOXA9 expression. HOXA9 and MES1, again, are cofactors which can then serve uh, to upregulate uh, certain types of genes and downregulate certain types of genes, maintaining a stem cell state 
that is that is uh, highly important in leukemogenesis in these types of uh, AML uh, cases. So uh, this paper in 2018 by Lorenzo Brunetti and, and others uh, in Cancer Cell basically looked at how uh, manipulating NPM1 mutant uh, uh, protein might abrogate the uh, leukemogenic potential of the NPM1 mutation. So they used uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing uh, and first basically edited out the C-terminal um, nuclear export signal that is introduced by the indel mutation and found that doing this relocalized uh, mutant NPM1 protein into the nucleus and nucleolus in two different AML satellites, OCI AML3 and IMS M2. Uh, now, importantly, nuclear relocalization of mutant NPM1 uh, induced cell growth arrest. So you can see cell counts in plating assays were markedly reduced uh, several days after introduction of these guide um, transcripts, deleting the nuclear export signal. Um, the indel frequency was markedly reduced following several days of this therapy uh, by morphology. Uh, uh, Editing these mutant uh, transcripts resulted in myeloid differentiation, which could be seen both by microscopy and by flow cytometry with increasing expression of markers like CD11B and MPO. So there is differentiation and increased survival of these uh, treated cells. Now that was for cell lines. They were also able to demonstrate this using primary AML cells, again, demonstrating that there was increased expression of CD11B, the progression or myeloid maturation, a myeloid maturation protein. Um, this was not seen in wild type samples, but was indeed seen in NPM1 mutated samples. And then they were also able to demonstrate that the indel frequency uh, as a result of introduction of this editing uh, technique uh, affected uh, mice, uh, affected uh, patient-derived xenograft models harboring uh, NPM1 mutant and FLIP3 ITD commutated profiles. So, um, you know, the next step was basically to demonstrate that depending on how the mutant transcript was edited uh, would determine what fraction of mutant protein really ended up in the nucleus and nucleus. And so they here they've demonstrated multiple different alleles edited slightly differently in each case. Uh, in each of these cases, uh, they noticed nuclear relocalization uh, and also found uh, phenotypic evidence of uh, myeloid cell maturation. Importantly, when they introduced an additional nuclear local uh, export signal, uh, what mutant protein was maintained uh, in the cytoplasm. Uh, as opposed to being relocalized to the nucleus. So uh, what was the result of this relocalization? By uh, doing RNA sequencing, they identified that in both of these cell lines, OCI AML3 and IMS M2, uh, relocalization of NPM, mutant NPM1 to the nucleus downregulated uh, several Hox uh, uh, transcription factors and also MES1. So notably, MES1 was highly downregulated, but also was HOXA9, HOXA10, and several other factors. Uh, implicating the uh, mutant NPM1 as being a, a very critical factor for the HOXA regulation, upregulation that had been seen many years previously. So, um, you know, one of the things they wanted to investigate was the potential to uh, create this uh, result without trying to do CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. So, uh, they used an XPO inhibitor, in this case, Selenexor, uh, to basically try to block uh, nuclear export of, nu of mutant NPM1 protein. And, doing the, and in doing this, they found that they could, in fact, relocalize mutant protein to the nucleus, that they were able to identify uh, phenotypic evidence of myeloid maturation, uh, that there was diminished RNA uh, uh, transcripts for several HOXA transcription factors and MES1, in the setting of cell and extra therapy. Uh, there was diminished uh, survival of these cells. Uh, and in PDX models, uh, diminished survival of, uh, 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 sorry, increased or prolonged survival of uh, mice treated with cell and extra. So uh, most recently, uh, this group led again by Brunetti uh, has tried to look at a second generation 
uh, sign. This is a selective inhibitor of nuclear export, again, an XPO1 inhibitor, uh, because uh, Selinexor um, uh, is a drug that crossed the blood-brain barrier and had uh, neurotoxicity, and the dosing required for Selinexor uh, in order to maintain nuclear relocalization was not uh, 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 compatible uh, in, human, uh, in human studies. Uh, Elfinexor, conversely, is a drug that does not cross the blood-brain barrier, and so, of course, uh, potentially has, uh, has promise uh, for therapy in this setting. And so in uh, the same uh, co-mutated mouse models, these are NPM1 mutated, FLT3 ITD co-mutated models, they found that uh, Eltanexor therapy pretreatment uh, reduced uh, bone marrow engraftment uh, by these uh, mutated cells, and you can see uh, reduced PET positivity uh, with, several, with uh, several weeks of Eltanexor therapy with five uh, days per week dosing. So uh, in the remaining time, I just want to touch on one other facet. Uh, this is targeting of the MN Menin-MLL uh, complex, which I've shown to be of importance in HOPSA9 gene regulation. <clears throat> so a lot of this work is performed by uh, Scott Armstrong's group at uh, Boston Children's, but also by the Grumbecka group uh, in Michigan. And so some of the work uh, first published was in 2016, demonstrating that uh, NPM1 muted AML cells are highly sensitive to either menin MLL1 complex or DOT1L inhibition. And DOT1L is another component of the overall MLL complex uh, that is important in HOXA9 uh, gene upregulation. And so treatment with a menin MLL1 inhibitor, in this case, MI503, uh, as you can see, uh, with several days of therapy, reduced colony counts uh, in NPM1 mutated uh, mice, uh, resulted in uh, myeloid cell maturation by microscopy, and re resulted in uh, downregulation of, again, numerous HOXA and HOXB genes and also MES1. Uh, additionally, uh, treatment with this compound uh, reduced uh, engraftment of human CD45 positive cells, these would be leukemic cells that are attempted to be engrafted. Uh, and again, uh, in xenograft models, reduced uh, expression of, in this case, HOXB4, MES1, and in fact, FLT3, which is a downstream target of MES1. Uh, in xenograft models, treatment with this drug prolonged survival. Uh, the same was also seen with DOT1L inhibition, again, with uh, dramatic downregulation of numerous Hox uh, genes and in, in the cofactor MES1. Uh, evidence, phenotypic evidence of uh, myeloid maturation, microscopic evidence of myeloid maturation, uh, and the same was also seen uh, in PDX models with prolonged survival with DOT1L inhibition. And I'm not going to show uh, the additional data, but they also uh, coupled menin ml ml one inhibition with DOT1 inhibition uh, and found a synergistic effect. So uh, most recently published in Science, again, Scott Armstrong's group uh, found that in a mouse model harboring a DNMT3A and NPM1 mutated, uh, NPM1 mutation uh, co-mutations, that uh, treatment with uh, a, um, uh, sorry, so this is the first slide. So that uh, in this mouse model, uh, what they found was that the NPM1 mutation, but not DNMP3 mutation, uh, was in fact the property that induced uh, the stem cell-like uh, uh, state of these cells. And so you can see that in DNMT3A uh, solo mutated cells, uh, there wasn't the same degree of HOXA9 expression. Importantly, uh, this expression pattern was seen in both lineage non-committed cells or uncommitted cells and also in committed cells, so gran uh, granulocyte, monocyte progenitor elements, indicating that the presence of NPM1 mutation is really an important driver uh, for resulting in this stem cell state. Uh, in this model, um, uh, so it, basically two concurrent studies, both uh, the one published in Science and also by Grimbecka's group at Michigan, used two different uh, types of menin MLL1 inhibitors, in this case MI3454, uh, to demonstrate that there was reduced engraftment <clears throat> in pretreated samples, 
Uh, again, reduced in, uh, expression of MES1 and many different Hox uh, genes, including HOXA9, uh, evidence of myeloid maturation. And then, uh, as I'd mentioned, concurrently around the same time, very similar data were produced by the Armstrong group using an orally bioavailable meta inhibitor, uh, VTB, VTP50469. Uh, again, demonstrating uh, markedly uh, reduced engraftment uh, in pretreated samples, uh, prolonged uh, survival, uh, and these were two different types of uh, mouse models. So in this case, a highly aggressive mouse model with mutant NPM1, FLT3, tyrosine kinase, and ITD co-occurring mutations. Now, one of the things they wanted to identify, uh, which basically corroborates you know, our previous study in a larger cohort, uh, was that NPM1 mutations are indeed rarely seen in uh, pre-leukemic states. Uh, they looked at uh, about 40 samples and identified uh, a few of them with NPM1 mutations, suggesting that uh, this targeted therapy uh, may be applicable in patients who have not yet progressed to overt leukemia. So uh, there are two uh, studies currently accruing patients, uh, both of them using uh, menin inhibitors. Uh, one is from uh, uh, a drug produced by Syndax Pharmaceuticals, another one by Kuro. Uh, and both of these are in phase one and two. Um, and at least the Syndax uh, study in phase two is expected to stratify patients by whether or not they harbor NPM1 mutations. So uh, just close with some open questions in future directions. The first of which is uh, an open question, uh, should C-terminal NPM1 mutations be considered AML defined? Uh, this is something that uh, Fellini's group has long proposed and one that uh, much of the evolving literature over the last decade uh, supports, uh, but it's not yet uh, AML defining by WHO criteria. Additionally, uh, there isn't really much evidence to understand uh, the bone marrow microenvironment in NPM1 mutated AML, and I uh, am attempting to pursue uh, this study using multi-parametric insight to imaging. I showed some brief preliminary examples of that type of data. Uh, one thing we don't know is how exactly the mutant NPM1 protein maintains menin MLL in an active state at HOXA9. Uh, we've obviously seen uh, that abrogation of mutant NPM1 downregulates HOXA9, but how exactly that activity occurs is really not yet well understood. Uh, it's yet unclear whether XPL1 inhibition using a second generation drug like Elsinexor will be efficacious in human patients, although I anticipate uh, phase one, two trials to be initiated in the, within the next year or two. And then lastly, uh, can NPM1 mutant protein be selectively degraded in AML patients? Uh, you know, I didn't show the data from Brunetti's uh, cancer cell paper, but they did in fact try to selectively degrade mutant protein, uh, which had the same effects as you might expect of relocalization to the nucleus. Um, some of this has been shown in 2015 using uh, uh, arsenic tetroxide and uh, actual combination therapy, but uh, there are novel molecules, small molecule degraders that might be tried uh, in the future to selectively degrade mutant NPM1, and that might selectively delete mutated cells, uh, thereby leaving stem cells unaffected. So with that, I'll close. I know I went through that uh, relatively quickly, but happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Sanya. That was great. Do you have any questions or comments? Extraordinary presentation. It was really great. I'm wondering about uh, this uh, Hox genes. You mentioned the um, uh, Hox A and B. I know that there is a class that has uh, actually four. It's a, a, B, C, D. Um, any changes that you're seeing in uh, the other Hoxes or are you seeing just the uh, a and B Hox genes in um, hematological malignancies? Yeah, I think the ones that uh, have been shown to be uh, specifically upregulated in the AML leukemias are, you know, uh, you know, only a several of them, including Hox A9, and Hox B4, MES1, importantly, and NPM1 AML. Um, and, and I think... <laughs> not necessarily consistent across all AML subtypes where there is Hox gene upregulation, but across all of the different Hox clusters, certain uh, different, definitely a subset of them appear to be enriched in AML. 
Thank you. Hello, I, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? It's, it's, it's Dr. Wolf. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, one, one of the greatest unmet needs in AML and MDS clinically is to find better treatments for patients who are P53 mutated. And I'm wondering if any of your work or the work you discussed uh, can uh, have any bearing on finding a new, better way uh, to treat those kinds of patients. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I'm, uh, you know, P53 targeted therapy is not really an area of my particular um, experience, but, um, and, you know, and interestingly, NPM1 mutated disease is almost always mutually exclusive with P53 mutation. So um, I think it's, you know, possible that the downstream effects of P53 mutation in some situations uh, mimic the downstream effects of NPM1, but they, I think they operate upstream through different mechanisms. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't really have a good answer, unfortunately. I know, I know there are some emerging um, types of targeted therapies that are out there, but I'm, I'm not uh, super well versed in those. Sanjay, yeah. um, I really enjoyed your talk and you covered an encyclopedic amount of material. So I'm wondering if I missed this. You talked about the idea of combining venetoclax with cytarabine, but if you showed it on the screen when you were showing the lack of effect of the um, hypomethylating agents, I missed it. Yeah. I okay. just wondered why those two agents. So I think you're, so, so this is the first study. And so, um, you know, largely these, the reason that we're just, that I, you know, the, that I am, you know, presenting these types of agents is because the, this first study and the subsequent study were largely in elderly patients who are unfit for conventional chemotherapy. Uh, so this is, you know, low dose, uh, cytarabine or hypomethylating agent therapy, uh, in addition to venetoclax. Uh, in the subsequent stair, uh, you know, the, in the subsequent study, uh, it was mainly either hypomethylene agent therapy alone or HMA plus venetoclax. Again, um, you know, I think uh, these were alternatives in patients who were unfit for induction chemotherapy. That's you know, my understanding. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you again so much, Sanjay, for, for coming on and, and talking to us about uh, your work and, and, um, and uh, in this field. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation. Thanks, Sanjay. Thank you, everybody. Great talk. great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.